I bet probably don't see too many uh, nucleic acids. I don't even remember what they're responsible for. Something with DNA. <laughs> Transcription? Mm -hmm. and trans so, not translation, right? Just transcription. Uh, well, they're kind of a part of both, which in the end result, they make what? Proteins. Yeah, they're the instructions. Right. Okay, so we are going to first, before we get into the specific macromolecules, we're going to start off by looking at some important chemical reactions. Just the overview of them throughout the course, we're going to go into more detail. Um, here we have a cell, and we like to think of it as a biochemical factory. So we input a bunch of building materials and energy, and we process those building materials and energy to transform into useful products that we need to use, and also waste products. And this is what the role of chemical reactions is in the cell. It's to create useful products. So when we think of the word metabolism, that's when we are using a bunch of chemical reactions, either in a cell or in an organism. And in chemical reactions, covalent bonds, so those bonds that are making up a molecule, they're either made, if we're making something, or they're broken. And these covalent bonds, they have stored energy in them. So stored energy is potential energy. So there's two types of chemical reactions that mostly happen, that we'll mostly cover. The first being catabolism, which is when you break a large molecule into smaller parts. So if you want a way to remember that, you can think of catabolism crunch. They both start with a C. You're crunching to break them up. Here we have an example of glycogen. That is a stored sugar in a liver, and it's being broken down into glucose. And remember what I said up here, those covalent bonds between the glucose molecules, they all have stored energy. So when we break them apart, we're getting energy out of that. The second chemical reaction is known as embolism. You can think of it as A for add. This is when you're taking small parts and you're building a larger molecule. So this time we're going the opposite direction. We have glucose and we create glycogen. Now here, to make something or to build something, it requires energy. Just like if you were to build something, you're putting energy into that. Polymers are formed by adding together identical or very similar subunits. Poly, if you break down that word, poly means many. And simple molecules are polymerized by a reaction called dehydration synthesis. Just like what it sounds, dehydration, if you're dehydrated, dehydrated you're thirsty. So that means that you're going to need water. You're going to get water out of it. 
you're dehydrating the reaction. So here we can see two subunits and then they get put together and a water is left over. So you can see here that the water is made up of these two parts, hydroxyl group and a hydrogen. They come together to form water and then now you have a new bond made that attaches those two subunits to form a polymer. And you can keep adding and adding, making longer and longer polymers using this dehydration synthesis. This is an example of building something, so that means you require energy for it. Little fun fact, did you know that more than 10% of the human's daily water requirements are met through just chemical reactions that release water? And the second reaction, this is that catabolic or crunch where we're breaking apart something. This is going to release energy because we're breaking a bond and water is a substrate. So that means that we need water in order to break apart this polymer, break apart this bigger molecule. So here, it's almost it's exact opposite. So this time we have the bond when we add water, we're just adding back on that hydroxyl group and that hydrogen group. Easy to remember if you think of hydro means water, you need water to make this reaction happen. So as we've learned in general biology one, macromolecules are made up of a bunch of repeating monomers to make polymers. So in carbohydrates, we have subunits or monomers of glucose, and they're added together to make polymers, which is a chain of glucose molecules. And they can be chained together differently to form these different polymers. So starch, glycogen, cellulose. Nucleic acids, their subunits are nucleotides. So in this case, their monomer is not always identical. It's a little different, right? We have A's and T's and C's. They're all a little different. And they're added together to make the polymer of either DNA or RNA. And lastly, we have proteins. Their subunits are amino acids. Again, they're a little different but once added together, they make a polypeptide chain, also known as a protein. I see a hand raised. Question? Um, I just wanted to know, what's the difference between DNA and RNA? We will get to that. Yeah, so if, when we get to that slide, if you're still not sure, ask me again. Good question, though. Um, you said that, it just says that carbohydrates have so the, the carbohydrates can be like divided into like different subunits as glucose? Yeah, so, so go ahead. Sorry, does glucose mean like glucose, sucrose, fructose? Is that like all contained within glucose? Yes, those are different monomers. Of glucose? Yes, they all so, look a little different. So carbohydrate, so carbohydrates contains glucose, fructose, sucrose, all of those O's things. And then within those, there's, there's starch and glycogen and cellulose and the rest? Okay, so here, this is, we're focusing on carbohydrates. Their monomer or their units, their single units are ribose, deoxyribose, glucose, fructose, galactose. So these are all, they just change by the number of carbons. Those are the single units. Yeah. 
That's when they're alone? Yeah, when they're alone. And then together they can make starch or glycogen or cellulose. Okay, and that would be any of those combinations would be considered a carbohydrate. Yes. Okay. Yes. Cool. Uh, here we just have a quick example. I'll go back to this page of a formation of protein. So we have two amino acids. Those are your monomer, your subunits. Your polymer is then your polypeptide chain. So you can have either dehydration to put the chain together or a hydrolysis to separate the chain. Now jumping into carbohydrates, we had covered a little bit from our nutrients. We know that carbohydrates are a source of energy for us. Right, if you think of sugar, sugar gives you energy. So they have, carbohydrates can be in different groupings. You can have monomers of carbohydrates or monosaccharides. These examples are ribose, I already went over these, but all they're changing with, when we say C5, that means that there's five carbons in that chain. You can have dimers, so think of di means two. And this is putting two of these monosaccharides together. So for example, glucose and galactose, if you were to put those together, you would get lactose. So putting two subunits together, you get a disaccharide, also known as a dimer. Oops. So one unit, two units. Polymer, poly means many. And these are when we start to see those longer chains of glucose. So actually I will clarify because I think in the last slide I did say that um, carbohydrates are only glucose, only chains of glucose, but that's not the case. Polymers, for the most part, are glucose units put together. But carbohydrates, they can be monomers or dimers or polymers. I seen a hand raised. Yeah, I was wondering what the polymer of lipids are. We'll get to that okay. when we get to lipids, yeah. Okay, so some important monosaccharides. Remember, mono meaning one. Hopefully you recognize these. These are the sugars that are found in as a part of a nucleotide. In DNA, we find deoxyribose. Here we see that there's the difference we have a hydrogen and in ribose, which is the sugar we find in RNA nucleotides, we have a hydroxyl group. So that's the only little difference between these two types of monosaccharides. I've seen another hand go up. Yeah, I have a question. So the, the PowerPoint page before, mm -hmm. I think there's one that says monomers as building blocks of polymers. Like, there's one before that one. Do we skip it or is it just my notes? Like, there's a page in between this one oh. and the next one. Oh, we'll get to that one. It might be in a different order for me. It does have oh, Lego okay. pieces on it, maybe. Okay, thank you. Yeah, yeah, it has, yeah. Yeah, it might be somewhere else on mine. Oh, okay, sorry. Yeah, we'll get to it. Didn't realize that was out of order. Uh, another important one, so these are your glucose, galactose, fructose. Notice that they, they look very similar. They're isomers of each other. So that means that the little differences kind of like mirror images. So here, the only difference between glucose and galactose is where this hydroxyl group is. So on glucose, it's on one side, and galactose, it's on the other. And fructose, it has a little bit of a different structure. Its carbonyl group is down one. 
And interestingly enough, I think it was in the 1970s, they found a way to change glucose, glucose into fructose, which is why we have those sugary soda drinks now, which are made out of fructose. They took corn syrup, they made like a new kind of corn syrup fructose to put into sodas. Another important thing that we'll see in this course is how plants make glucose by photosynthesis. Okay, so here might help make a little bit more sense of the polymers for carbohydrates. Here's an example of starch, which we find in potatoes. So here's a polymer of starch. It's this long chain of just glucose monomers. So a bunch of glucose put together. In glycogen, which we find in liver and muscle tissues, it's still that glucose monomer, but you'll notice that it's chained a little differently. It almost looks more like a tree. It doesn't look like that straight chain. And lastly, in cellulose, that's what you find in plant cell walls, um, especially like grasses and haze. This is again single glucose monomers, but now they have kind of this connection between each other. So they're creating almost like a, um, a tissue sort of thing, a layer. They're all connected. Is that a question? Yeah. Was the shape of the, the um, glucose uh, monomer like pattern, like the, the one where it twirls, the one where it branches, and the one where it's straight, does that affect how we digest it? Well, that's an excellent question, which we'll cover right here. <laughs> Good intuition. So here we're looking at cellulose and starch. And again, we know that their single units are glucose, but the difference is the way the two come together. So that bond in cellulose is called a beta position, it's in a beta position, and in starch, which we find in potatoes, it's in an alpha position. Our bodies, so human bodies, cannot digest beta bonds. They can't break them. We don't have the enzymes to do it. Actually, no vertebrate can. So I know you're wondering, well, why do you have a cow up there eating hay? Like, why can cows eat hay? And that's because Cows and some other vertebrates and even termites, they have a symbiotic relationship with some bacteria in their gut, and those bacteria can break it down for the animal. So we don't have those. But like what you're asking, it does affect the way we can digest certain types of carbohydrates. So we can't digest cellulose, but we can digest starch. So does that mean like, um, like sugar levels will vary like, um, in like, let's say in our, well, in, yeah, sugar levels between like, if we eat a starch and like something that's like a cellul cellulose structure, would that affect like how much sugar is released into like the bloodstream or, or whatever? Yeah. So we can, um, readily use glucose. So that single monomer, monosaccharide, we can use that. But if we can't break it down to be that single monomer, we can't use it. So for cellulose, if we can't break those beta bonds, then we can't use it. So we can't digest that. Okay. And starch, we can. So, and, and these, this cellulose, is that in, you said that's just in plant cells? Yeah, it gives the plants that very... Um, stringent those cell walls. Now some plants have more cellulose than others. Like hay has a lot of cellulose in it. That's why we can't eat hay. Whereas some plants they have it but we can still digest it to a certain point. Okay, mm -hmm. okay. that's what I was wondering. 
Another example is chitin, and this is a polymer. Looks a little different. It actually has uh, acetyl amine group here. So you can see it here. And this carbohydrate can do many things. It can form the exoskeletons. So you see one shedding its skin here. It's also used as surgical thread and it forms a part of the cell wall in fungi. So just a little fun example. Okay, I'm going to break you into groups for this. This kind of relates to the question that was just recently asked about us breaking down sugars. So in groups, I'd like you to discuss these questions. What food should you eat before working out? And what food should you give someone with really low blood sugar to rapidly restore glucose? And then how do these foods differ? I'm only gonna give you like three minutes in your breakout rooms. Any questions before I break you up? Is the, is the grass supposed to be grass or like vegetables? It doesn't have to be those, I don't, it's just, uh, you wouldn't want to eat grass, I'll tell you that. <laughs> Not gonna help you. you can choose any, any food you want. Okay.
All right, so let's start with the food you should eat before working out. Remember, that means that we want, we're going to be burning a lot of energy, so we want to make sure that we have enough energy that will last throughout the workout. What kind of foods did you choose? Uh, fruit, because it's easily di digestible and it has like a good amount of natural sugar, so it'll keep you energized and focused and you'll be able to digest it quickly. Okay, uh, any other ones? Any other types of food? Pasta, since, since it has a lot of uh, carbohydrates and that can give you a lot of energy. Mm -hmm. Good. We heard of like the spaghetti dinner before the night before a big race or a big hockey game. Um, we also said like bread with peanut butter or any type of nut butter to get energy from the carbs in the bread. Great. Yeah, carbs and bread. Um, so remember, you want the energy to last. So if you want it to last, we want it to take a long time to be broke down. So in foods like pasta and bread, these are more of your like starch, which means that they're kind of more of a longer polysaccharide. They take longer to break down because they have so many of those bonds to break. We can't use them right away. So when we say we want it to last, these are the kind of foods we want to choose. Now the fruit, I like your idea because it will give us energy, but that might have a better fit here because we want to rapidly restore blood sugar. So fruit have glucose in them that's more readily available for our blood streams to absorb. So fruit would definitely be good to give to someone. For, um, for the stuff before workout, isn't doesn't that depend on time? Like, let's say if I'm spontaneously like, oh, 15 minutes, I'm going to work out. That would be different than like, oh, tomorrow I have a CrossFit competition and I'm going to eat like a big bowl of pasta beforehand, you know? Wouldn't yeah. it depend, wouldn't, be, wouldn't it be somewhat circumstantial? Yes, I could see that. It depends like how long you want the energy to be used for. Yeah, yeah. that's good. Okay. Um, for right away, so let's say there was someone with very low blood sugar, like a diabetic, what kind of carb would you give them for food? Uh, chocolate. Mm -hmm. Yum, chocolate. I would give them a, a soda because it's, it'll be easily, there's nothing really to break down. Like I'm assuming maybe that's wrong, but there's nothing really to be broken down. It's kind of going to get absorbed really fastly because it's like in a liquid form. Yeah, exactly. Not only like that it's in a liquid form necessarily, but that the glucose is not in that polysaccharide. It's not a long chain that needs to be broken down. It's in those little monosaccharide units or disaccharide. Great. So when we think about why these foods differ, it is by their, I'm going to say, well, I was going to say size, but I don't mean size of food. I mean size of carb, carbohydrate. And just to note again, um, never eat grass. We can't digest it. Okay, so this is the page that probably... Uh, someone was referring to before it says monomers as building blocks of polymers. So we think of if you think of Lego, it's a really good example because we have these similar looking blocks and then we stack them, we get our polymer. Now, before I take these up, I want you to quickly write down what your answers, what you think your answers will be. So for carbohydrates, what are the building blocks or the little Legos? For nucleic acids, what are they? And for proteins, what are they? And we give a little hint with the number beside them. Are we at the, at the page where there's images of RNA and DNA or is it the Lego blocks? 
Well, I think that this one has been moved. So just jump to this one and then we're going to go back to the nucleotides. So we're at we're at um we're at Lego blocks here? Yes. Okay. Okay, so for the Lego blocks of carbohydrates, what are those single Lego blocks? Glucose. Mm -hmm. Yeah, glucose. So if we put lots of glucose together, we'd be getting our polymer. What about for nucleic acids? Nucleotides. Yep, nucleotides. And see how there's four different colors? It really should be five, but it's because nucleotides, they're similar, but they're not exactly the same. And in proteins? Amino acids? Yeah, great. And there's 20 different amino acids. That's why we have a range of colors in the picture. Is there um, the dis there's a long chain and short chain amino acids? Yeah, uh, there can be a peptide chain, which is just a few, and then a polypeptide, which is many. Okay, and how, um, I've, I've heard that it's important to get like all, all different types of amino acids, so the long chain and the short chain, but like if, if, if the amino acids are just like chains of, you said poly, like the polymer chains, wouldn't it just be the same thing, or are they broken down differently, or do they like do something different, like for amino acids to have like more or less like for them to be long or short like what's what why do they differ um can i answer your question when we get to those slides just in case sure. there's there might be a good diagram that kind of relates to that but i will definitely answer that once we get to that slide okay cool it's a good question i just don't want to uh jump to proteins quite yet yeah. <laughs> okay, so after carbohydrates, we're covering nu uh, nucleotides, which are the monomers, but nucleic acids, which are the polymers. Nucleic acids are the macromolecule. Remember from last year that nucleotides, they have a nitrogenous base. So here's the different bases. And then they have a sugar that they attach to. So here's an example of a typical nucleotide. They have a sugar, one of those nitrogenous bases, which can be swapped out depending on which nucleotide they are, and a phosphate group. And nucleic acids, are the polymers of these. So we are taking, for the polymer, we're taking many different nucleotides and putting them together in a chain. So here, if you look at this picture, this is a picture of the polymer. And each one of these is the monomer. So this is a nucleotide in green, this is a different nucleotide in orange and yellow. And when we talk about nucleic acids, they can either be RNA or DNA. Does anyone remember some of the differences between the two? Uh, there's a there's a nucleotide that differs. There's there's U. Is it U? Or there's U, or there's like a different nucleotide. Uh, yes. Uh, oh, sorry. In, in RNA, I think there's U, and in DNA, it's just the normal ones. Mm -hmm. So in DNA, there is A, C, G, and T. There's no U. And in RNA, there's U, G, A, and C. So the difference is in T and U. They have different nitrogenous bases. 
Any other differences between DNA and RNA that you can remember? Yeah, the sugars are different. One has a deoxyribose, the other one's a ribose. So there's like an extra OH group. Yeah, great. So here's a sugar. This is deoxyribose, so part of the DNA. I'll just label it. RNA has ribose. So in that sugar, there's actually an OH here too. So two OHs. What else? There's some, a few more differences. This is more of like a question and also potentially an answer to a to a difference. But is is a uh, is RNA less stable than DNA? I don't know how I would define stable, anyways, but. Um, it might, someone just answered in the chat about double helix and like single stranded and double stranded. So in that way, maybe the double strand keeps it together a little tighter. It's less able to get destroyed. Yeah. So that could be, I guess, when you say stable. Okay. But yes, RNA is single stranded and DNA is double stranded. What about where they're found? Or like what organisms are found in? DNA is in the nucleus? Yes. Yep, they're definitely found in the nucleus. And is RNA like ribosomes? I, I think. Mm -hmm. Our RNA is read by ribosomes. Oh, okay. mRNA, yeah, definitely. RNA is found in prokaryotes. They don't have DNA. Uh, we, uh, eukaryotes, we have both. Isn't RNA used as a template to transcribe DNA or something like that? Yeah, exactly. So in our nucleus it protects dna and when it has to leave the nucleus we turn it into a messenger rna just like you said it's a template strand so it's not damaged and that template strand is then turned into proteins it's read and turned into proteins so that kind of leads us to an important here important note it contains genetic information, so important information, that determines protein synthesis. So the making of a protein. It's kind of like the instructions for a protein. Uh, and it's transmitted during cell division. So it's passed on. Hopefully that clarifies what the difference is between RNA and DNA for whomever asked. Okay, this is kind of new information. So nucleotides, which we looked at before, their basic structure, they can actually be modified to do important functions in the cell. Adenine, so the A nucleotide, can be modified by adding on two more phosphate groups to it. So when you get to add those two phosphate groups, usually it only has one. When you add on the other two, it becomes ATP. And ATP, that's our energy currency for our body, what we need to do, perform a lot of chemical reactions. And nucleotides can also be modified for other chemical reactions. I am not going to go into those today. It's a little too complicated for right now, but just so you can kind of see these molecules now, and then when we return to them, they won't be, uh, they'll be familiar. So we have NAD, NADP, and FAD. So you'll see these in the future. 